And we are alive again. So hi and hello to my stream again. Um, after yeah, skipping last week to being a little bit sick, um, and I wanted to protect my voice because I had a, also had a conference session this week. Um, we're back on schedule now, and today, even with the dog in the background, as long as it behaves, so shout out to Matthew. <laughs> um, maybe we should get a, a found a club with dogs on couches. Um, can't promise that she will behave, though, because she's a young Dalmatian and they have a ton of energy. So I hope uh, I won't need to throw her out at some point. What are we going to look at today? We are not going to um, work on the same application um, than we did in the last time. We won't stop working on that application, no worries. Oh, let me turn on the light. Um, but last time um, I was asked a little bit about RAM, um, the front-end library I'm using in the back-end to uh, render. And I thought it would be unfair to the library to just present its back-end rendering capabilities um, because it is has is really, really powerful in the front-end. And although I'm not um, the best ClojureScript developer or the best front-end developer, um, I wanted to take a short detour to show you what this framework or library is really capable of. And let's start. Hi, Stefan. Nice to have you on the stream again. So um, to get in a nice development workflow with RAM, I'm using FigWheel main. Um, FigWheel is um, if you have worked with ClojureScript, I bet you know of it. Um, the oh, let me make that a little bigger. Um, the FigWheel maintainers say um, that this is yeah builds your ClojureScript code and hot loads it as you are coding, so um, we can. Enable the FigWe main server and we just code. And the moment we press save, our web page is loaded again. And um, this is a very, very nice workflow for coding, which we will see. We will start with a template. Um, okay, let me check this. You're not seeing the terminal. Now you're seeing it. And with this command, we just um, build our environment, our development environment. And um, yeah, it is handy to have something like this um, ready to use because um, you don't really want to set up a closure script environment with hot loading by hand. And we will see why that is. Uh, wait a second, where did I create that? Okay. Okay, what do we have here? Um, we have a lining version, a line version. We have the common description, URL, and license. We have the source paths, and we have the fig wheel configuration set up here. Um, we can just run fig and um, do a run with um, a normal trampoline run. We can start a build, which builds everything in the dev profile. Uh, min, which uh, creates an uh, advanced build with um, minified resources. So this is what you want to use in production. And of course we have test. And it also should create a small 
example application here. So my Emacs configuration is a little off, so it loads closure script files in closure mode. I will have to check on that. Um, yeah, this is what we, we are seeing here. We are having um, a multiply method, which is not used in the app, but in the test. Uh, we have an atom containing the state of the application. We're having a function which returns the app element. We'll uh, check that out. We have a RAM component, RAM dev C dev component, hello world, which prints um, the text from the state atom in the header and a subheader. We've got a mount function which, which mounts our RAM component into the application. Yeah, mount app element, that's um, a wrapper around the mount function. We have the mount app element, and after reload, um, remounting the element again. So far, so good. Let's run it. We can use uh, cider jack in cljs for that. And now cider should ask me what the REPL should connect to. We can say fig wheel, fig wheel main, fig wheel connected, browser, node.js, weasel, boot, or shadow CLJS, and also Krell if we wanted to do React Native. But we are running fig wheel main and we want to connect to that in the dev scope. Still loading. Just want to minify that. Now it opened the wrong browser. Give me a second. Okay. Also increasing the size again. So this is what we have here. We are having the um, everything here on the left. We have the REPL, which I really wish I could minify, but it doesn't. Let's just close it for a while. And we have the browser on the right. And the reason why I um, opened up everything side to side is because I wanted to show you how it really changes if we just hit save. So you're seeing on the bottom left corner, the CLJS logo popped up. Um, and again, I just changed the word edit it to edit, pressing save. And now it's also updated in the browser. And it really cannot be any more interactive than this. This is of course not due to RAM, it is entirely due to fig wheel main. And yeah, this is a lot of fun if you want to do web development like this. Um, what really so the header is um provided by the um, content of the app state atom. So what happens if we change that? Let's translate it to German. Nothing happens. And this is what I would expect. Because um, the atom changed, but the component did not get the notice that the atom changed. So um, it has no reason to re-render and has no reason to adapt to the latest value. 
for this, let's jump into the documentation of RAM. So RAM is a React wrapper and people like React because it can react on state changes in the global app state. So the idea is that I just change the state of my web application and the components react to that in real time. Hi Bulchai, greetings to Koblenz I believe, right? Um, so I don't need to Imagine if you have a very, very big single page application with a complex state and every time you change the state, you also need to know um, which of the components you need to update. And this is something that React solves really well. I'm not a big fan of, for, of uh, using React for everything. Um, I talked about this to a lot of people. Um, and annoyed them maybe a little bit. But uh, this is something that React does really, really well. So obviously, um, RAM does this, is able to do that too. So here's the part of updating components manually if we wanted to do that. But we are interested in reactive components. So if we add this mix in to our component, it marks the component as reactive. And it, when we access the macro, we do this with rum slash react. And this should be it. So of course now I changed the component which triggered the component to be re-rendered. But if I go and change the atom again, the, re the component realizes this. Okay, the dog just decided it doesn't didn't want to be on the on its um what is it called um, on its sheet again? So it's it's still there, but moved out of camera. Maybe she's not really comfortable with being that famous. And this means we can change just the atom if we want to change our application state. And RAM takes care of the rendering. So again, to make sure it wasn't just a one-off. Hello Welt, and in just yeah under a second or one to two seconds, um, the component realizes, hey, something changed. I need to re-render. Um, what I want to do now is recreate a small application I already um, programmed with RAM, and um, something that is. Um, always taken as an example for doing front-end work, it's creating a front-end for Hacker News. Because the Hacker News API is, um, you don't need an authorization for that, it's that simple to use, and um, it's a good playground for this. So what we need first is an HTTP client. And for this, I like to use CLJ HTTPS. Not HTTP, HTTPS. Ah, CLJS, of course. So this is a closure script library that enables um, our application to um, interact with web services with Clojure Core Async. Let's just copy the dependency. And 
and um, better quit cider for once. Connect to fig wheel main def. And now we also can. No, something strange about my Emacs today. Ah, okay. Now there it is. So we are refreshing our page and everything looks as we would expect it. Then we require this macro according to documentation, of course. And we require the HTTP client and core async. So what we want to do now is call the Hacker News API. Hacker News um, has an API based on Firebase. And the URI is really, really, really simple. So um, we want to get the top posts of the page. And this is the HTTP call to do so. I have to throw the dog out because it is eating the couch. Wait a second. Hey. Come. Come, Sometimes she sleeps for an hour or two, sometimes not. Okay. So what this HTTP call does is it just lists the latest 500 top stories. Um, as IDs. Okay, we, we can live with that. So let's put this here. Just like to copy the example here. Open the console. of the response and now we call the API and if um, asyncly as you can see with um, the greater than exclamation mark function which I still don't know how to pronounce properly and the go command executes everything so if the call returns we are printing the body and we're seeing that this body here just contains all the IDs in Chrome. And it would be really cool if we could add this to our atom, right? So let's call it posts and the posts key in the atom map of the keyword has a vector. And if 
we call it successful swap app state asoc post body response okay cool the next thing we want to do is list them in our component right because um yeah this is really nice but um, there is no text anymore so we need a unsorted list and in every for the list in every item uh, should be one of the ids uh, for the start so what i'm doing now might be a little surprising A little bit more expressive, and also do it like this. So for every post ID, an li with the content post ID. And it works. It's ugly, but it works. Um, yes, the response body is deserialized from JSON automatically. Um, so the response... Let me just print the whole response in the console so we can look at it. You can see we have a status 200, we have success true, and the body um, is deserialized in to an EDN format from JSON or in the closure data structure. Let's say it like this. We also can access the content type here in the browser. That's really small, I know that, but I'm not sure I can't increase the console size on Chrome. Sorry for this. Um, so yeah, we, we get everything as a closure data structure um, directly because the content type of the response is application JSON and uh, CLJS HTTP adapts to that. So getting all those hundreds of IDs, I don't really want that. We want to have it a little smaller. So we only want take 10. And this is a little bit less overwhelming. So why did I use four here? Because, um, yeah, that's not the first thing that comes to mind when writing closure code, right? Um, this is explained here in the documentation of RAM. Be it is because of performance. It says here, Daikiri, RAM's hiccup compiler, pre-compiles certain closure forms that return hiccup into React calls. When the compiler is not able to pre-compile a form, it defers this operation to the runtime. Runtime interpretation is slower. The suggestion is to use closure forms that are handled by compile form when it makes sense. So here you can see um, for is a known form which a well-defined syntax. This hiccup is pre-compiled. And if I used map for that, map is a generic higher order function, can't reliably pre-compile, falling back to interpretation. So yeah, is this as stated? Um, because I'm using the for here, um, the precompiler of RAM, which is called Daikiri, which I also like very much, um, is able to precompile this 
for uh, before sending it to hiccup and this is generally faster so now we can see a list of ids um let's just quickly refactor this put this in the top fetch out posts oh. yeah it's good if we put it below the app state and just do it a little dirty put the call at the end so if the page is loaded um we trigger the http call yeah there is um uh, for a list of these forms uh to your stefan uh, to your question stefan is there a list of known forms um for a list of these forms see compile form implementations into react calls um yeah that's um not really readable i would like us to have some more documentation here uh, but uh, you can get the idea we have um cont cont p do let let ask risk let if n for if if not and so on and so on so um, you can read the supported forms for pre-compiling uh, from the um, compiler source code. So we needed an AP API call to fetch the whole data, right? Uh, to fetch a post. Let's get back to the Hacker News API. And do it like this. We have an item. So create a new function, fetch post from post ID. still compiled so let's try this open up the console again although you cannot see it very good we call it fetch post and just let take this id And of course, I need to include the ID here. Just going to do that very, very simply with str. Okay, no course policy. That's interesting. Why? So we don't, we don't need the query params. I'm really, really sure of that.
<laughs> and I agree with you, Stefan. Read the compiler source code. Um, ah, I, I almost uh, stepped down to do language bashing here from a language from which I would uh, expect something like this, but contained myself. Okay, why am I getting... Of course. Okay, if I set the parenthesis right, then everything works. Um, with credential faults is um, required to make uh, CORS um, work. So I have that in the string function as last parameter. Um, yeah, know your indentations, right? So let me try and copy that here. This is the response. Um, so we have a timestamp when this was posted. We have the title. We have the kids, which are the comments, I believe. The post ID, the score on Hacker News, and the URL and the author. So we get a lot of information about that post. And um, can remove this now. And now um, we just just need to store the result in the atom also. Mm, I just realized that this should be called post IDs. Let me just change that very quick, quickly. Should be everything. Yes, still working. Great. And this is a map posts. And for every post, I will create uh, the post ID as a keyword and the post itself as a value. Which translates to let's do first this should be an oh no no no, no it's not an array never mind Now I lost track what I wanted to do. Here I am again. can use ASOC in like this. Okay. So in the posts entry in the atom, we add um, a new entry in the map for every post. So what we could do is for the start to try this um, with a, f I believe I need to do sec here. Let
just restructure a little bit. No protocol as defined for lazy sec. Wait, but this worked, right? Okay, now I'm lost. Just to check, this still works, right? doesn't let's let's reload everything okay maybe i just introduced something in the state that was not really helpful let's show it the network tab okay um it might be again a little bit bit too small for you. I uh, have to think about something here. But we can see that the top stories were fetched and then there are 10 calls to the detailed stories. So we are fetching them in the background. And if we print the app state, Or if we dereference the app state, okay, not like this. Um, we can see that we have the post IDs and you have a list of all the posts. Let's define a new component. We need a diff and just first get the post from the state let post just see Yes, yeah, so key afterwards. Thank you. And to just simply test it, H2. With the title of the post. And instead of an LI here, We want to mount, oh, that's a good one. We don't need a diff here. We want an li. And nothing's happening. Invalid RT zero. Where? 
194. Oh, we don't have that. Great. In the post component. Ah, yes. Let's reload. Okay. The posts get bigger. We have a list element, but the title is empty. Let's check our code by hand. We have this ID. Ah, yes. There is another layer in there. And there it is. Always remember what you build. And look at that. We have the headlines of the top Hacker News posts. And just to see faith in government declines when mobile internet arrives, that's depressing news. Some idiot is using your tool to mask scan our network. It's also there. So the order is right and the titles are right. Now let's try and use some deconstructing here. We want the title, we want the by. Let's see what we had here. Title, by, score, and URL. Here. Okay, so we have the title. And I would really like to wrap that title in a link. And the href of that link is the URL. Is that still working? It's working. It used to work. Ah, okay. So back navigation is not uh, really factored in now. Below, we want to have a span, and in this span, I want to have the very simple string score points posted by by. Okay, that looks good. Cool, that looks like it's working. Um, okay. This is ugly, right? So it's functional, um, but it's really, really ugly. So time to throw some CSS in the mix. Let's first pass in a class here. Um, post. And React uh, always complains that every item needs a key. So we need the post ID as a key. And for the diff here, for the wrapper, we want to have the class posts. Why not keep it 
plane. So um, in the beginning, I told you that um, RUM is mounting its components into a web page. And the web page we can access. This is a really, really plain updated Emacs, cannot increase the font size anymore. So this is just a static HTML file with the diff, with the ID app. Um, the um, component is mounted into the diff and we can see that there is also a style sheet configured. And maybe write in the chat how comfortably and how happy you are to work with CSS. I like it. You can quote me on that. I like CSS. I think it's really well thought through. Um, but some web frameworks make it really hard to work with CSS. Hate it. That's a strong feeling for a language. So, and the cool thing here is that fig will main is also monitoring the CSS. Bam, border. Margin. No list style type. No padding. Okay, this looks a little nicer, doesn't it? So to make it look nicer on the stream, we can adapt the background to the stream's background. I'm sorry for your eyes. By the way, how cool is that that Emacs highlights the colors in CSS automatically? And yeah, I would say this is basically it. The only thing I can do now is open up the project that um, I test ran before because it had some nice additions. So first side of quit, close that buffer. Kill all those. Sources, closure, hacker news, SRC, core. Um, in this project, I added a little autoloader. And I added a little animation, so when a component is re-rendered, it shakes a little bit. Um, it took me longer to figure out how that works, as I'm comfortably 
admitting. Um, so we're not going to recreate that. So it basically looks the same. And just reload here. And if we upvote, oh, I'm not locked in in Chrome, have to upvote in Safari. I uploaded the first element. And um, while we are talking, we should see it rising to 80 points at some point and hopefully shaking too. So I believe it's already time to summarize because Matthew's stream will be starting at 1 p.m. I highly recommend him as always. Um, yeah, I'm not the biggest single page application advocate and front-end guy. There is a great post by the people of InnoQ, which went uh, on their blog this week, um, where they just discuss a little bit. Oh, it updated, but didn't shake. That makes me sad. Um, how they, where they discuss when single page application frameworks are justified and when not. Um, I will I have retweeted that. I can post it on my Twitter again um, because it makes really valid points. Um, and the key takeaways I remember is single page application frameworks are great if you are having a massive and big front end and you need the tooling to help yourself uh, structurize the front end. They make sense if time to market is critical. So you need to roll out that application very, very fast. And um, they are justified if you have interactive elements that should survive page navigation, for example, a video player. For all other use cases, I'm not really comfortable with single page application frameworks. Now it checks without changing, great. And um, do you know why? Um, okay, it's not fair if I, this is the uh, uncompressed version. So this is not fair, it downloads six megabytes. Um, but if I do a production build of this application and um, run it, then I get 500 kilobytes of JavaScript. And I believe that's not justified for what the application is doing. Um, so I have browsed some applications lately which were created with several closure script frameworks with uh, shadow cljs with reagent ohm rum and in the payload there is always between one and six megabytes of javascript and i do believe that is not acceptable for websites aimed at end users so if you have any questions left to that topic um you can just write it in the chat. I will add some links in the chat now. So you can, um, yeah, compare that to the Hello World Spring Boot application. That's also true, but uh, the Hello World Spring Boot application is very, very efficient on the user's side. So um, it's a difference if the application is resource hungry on my server, or if the user with the crappy um, mobile internet on his phone um, needs to download five megabytes of JavaScript just to see some text. Let me also search the blog. Here it is. Good arguments for SPA. Very, very nice read. And um, yeah, for me, this is it. Um, if you liked it, um, tell your friends, tell your colleagues, this recording will go up on YouTube also. And yeah, um, I just suggest everybody just tunes in into Matthew's channel, um, where he will show us a little bit of his tricks. I meant if you put tons of features into the app, the growth will be much slower because you have the foundations included already in your small app. That's right. Yeah, that's a good point. So I will raid into Matthew's channel. Not that that many viewers are left, but
But um, yeah, thank you for tuning in again. And I hope to see you next week again. Bye.